Okay, next we have one amazing woman, Morgana Ray. She knows more about educating people on how to develop a good relationship with money than anyone I've ever seen anywhere. And she's not only done that for herself, but she's done that for th thousands of clients all over the world. Morgana? I want to mention also, she is also a best-selling author. <laughs> Can, if I shut this, will that? First, I want to thank Vicki for bringing me. Uh, I was already an international best-selling author before I met Vicki, so that's a little different. Now I am a best-selling author many times over and I have never met anybody who makes you a best-selling international author, makes it so easy and affordable. So this is what I know having the perspective of comparison. So thank you. I really, I'm in awe of your expertise and generosity. Thank you. So who would like to make money fall in love with you? <laughs> so what I'm going to be teaching you in our little bit of time together is how to make more money by putting love first. Anything that is out of integrity, out of your value system, out of your joy does not fit. And before I dive into that, just a word on the power of books, because that's what we're talking about here. Uh, for any, anybody here a service provider or a teacher or a healer of any kind, our energetic limit for how many people we can serve one-on-one -on -one is really, really low, especially if we are not charging enough. And that's another conversation. But what I found and the reason I created my first book was I had a few years of having, I think 2007, I had over 300 clients and I was burnt out and swore I would never do that again. And I created a book as a way to serve and assuage my own guilt for all the people that I did not want to coach anymore. And there are benefits to that. You get to be a good person. If somebody is not ready to invest in you where you want to be at the level you want to be invested in, you have something else they can do. And yesterday I received an email from a private client named Pam who hired me after working with my book two years in a row because I created a, a workbook to use every year. I wanted for me something interactive more than just reading, but a, you know, a doing. And when she first contacted me before hiring me, she wrote to me that she had already had her first quarter of a million dollars in sales month just using the workbook, which told me, great, my stuff works on her. So I didn't need somebody who was in crisis and try to milk money out of somebody who didn't have it. I was able to serve before she came to me. And what I'm going to be teaching you is the exercise that she used herself before she ever hired me. And my intention for this beautiful group is when I'm done, you will never look at money the same way again. So my core philosophy in life, and this is more than just money, but it has everything to do with money is when you are doing everything right, everything you're supposed to do, everything you're capable of doing, and you are not seeing results, there is always a very, very good reason. You are not a failure. You're not a loser. You are, in fact, very successfully protecting yourself from what you think you want. And there are always very good reasons. You are not a fool. I have trouble 
understanding the idea of self-sabotage from a logical point of view. Why would you? I don't believe we sabotage ourselves. I believe that our unconscious picks up certain ideas about what is safe and what isn't safe. And if something isn't safe, the brakes are on. And no matter what you do, your experience will be like driving with the brakes on. So would you like to learn how to take your foot off the brakes in money and love? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to teach you my six steps of financial alchemy. Alchemy, my own personal working definition of alchemy, is the transmutation of lead, as in lead in human experience, into spiritual and material gold. Which means that the person here who is in the most pain and anxiety and maybe you want to add shame and fear and grief and all that, you win because you have the most material to turn into gold. And so the law of attraction police are not going to be here. You're not going to be punished for having low vibrations and negative thoughts. In fact, they are going to be infinitely useful for the beginning of this process. What we want to do is we want to create maximum polarity. There is no magic in neutrality, but the more polarity, the more we can go into the first step of alchemy, alchemy, which goes back tens of thousands of years, classical alchemy, the first step is negredio, the blackening, the extraction, the isolation of what isn't working so that all we're left with on the other side is what we want. Because when we have a little bit of ich and positive thinking, we just end up with a lot of mud in the middle. So to start with, we want to uncover the root cause of what you're protecting yourself from. And the secret there is the root cause of your money problems, issues, challenges, limitations is never really about money. So I have a lot of coaching friends. I've been doing this relationship with money stuff since the very beginning of 2003, and I've been coaching since 96. Uh, when I started, nobody was talking like this. I think maybe, I think maybe Harvecker was talking about relationship with money, but in a very, very different way. And since then, it's become really popular and people talk about money as energy and money as a tool and money as a measure of value, all of which is true and useless to me because I don't know how to have a relationship with a tool. But a person, that's real. So the root cause of your money situation is not going to be in your money story. Our money situation comes from much deeper stuff. And as painful as your money situation may be, money itself doesn't really exist. It's, it's made up. It's a shared, agreed upon delusion. It doesn't exist in nature. We arbitrarily decide that one purse is worth $5 and another is worth 5,000, but they do the same thing. And we agree to pretend on that level of value. But what is very real and affects us in every area of our life every day are the issues that money represents deep down. And those issues are worth. What are we worth? To ourselves and to others all of our all of our deepest issues about our worthiness our deservingness really soft white underbelly of being a human being stuff and the next issue that money represents is our lovability our first experience of money was our parents they fulfilled the role of money they told us whether we were valued. They kept us safe or they didn't. They clothed us, they fed us, they housed us, or in some cases they didn't. But money 
takes the role later in life of who our parents were for us. So that's a place to look. I also have had clients who have had very happy childhoods and great parents, but then things happen later, teased at school, some bad teacher, maybe some experience of abuse or predation, a broken love affair, an accident, something happened, which actually the accident leads to the third thing that money represents, which is our own safety, our own right to exist, especially for those living in the United States, where if you don't have money, you don't get health care and you don't deserve to live. It's very heavy stuff, and that's actually why money is so important and why it's so important to have a good relationship with it, because these issues really represent our relationship with ourself and life. So the issues that go into our financial situation will also reverberate everywhere else, directly and indirectly. Because what's so useful about money is money has its fingers in everything, in our spirituality, our sexuality, our romance, our environment, our life purpose, our health. There's really nothing that isn't impacted by money directly. And also those issues about how we feel about ourselves, how lovable we feel, how loved we feel, and how safe we feel in the world is also going to be hugely impactful in our ability to make money and keep it. And by the way, sometimes people think when I'm talking about relationship with money, I'm only talking about people who don't have it. Well, actually, this is just as true for people who have vast amounts of money. And because more money, more problems, has anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. So if you have fear of wealth, you're not insane. And what you want to do is you want to have a great relationship with money wherever you are because that increases your capacity to have more without fear of losing it and having better relationships with other human beings. So you become less of a target because you have healthy, loving boundaries. Um, a client of mine who went with me to Bali for my Money Goddess Retreat in 2013, funny thing, I was speaking at her event in Sun Valley, Idaho. And I didn't get why she left LA for Idaho until I went to Sun Valley and it's like, oh my God. Uh, but what I didn't realize when she asked me to speak at the Sun Valley Wellness Festival, and she's on the stage in front of hundreds of people sharing what happened after she went with me to Bali, she made over $12 million. And I was like, and she never told me that. And it all had to do with learning to love herself and value herself and not be ashamed to ask for what she wanted and not being afraid to fight what she, for what she wanted for herself and her family. So... I started with step number one, which is uncover the root cause. And the way you do that is you look at your life and anything that ever made you feel unloved, unsafe, or unworthy, anything you have any shame about, any regret. And it may be very present and close to you now, or it may be in your past. It may actually be something that you thought you had healed. And by the way, that's great. And if you can still use it, you still get to use it. I don't think healing things makes them go away. You will always have enough of a charge if it will use you. You don't want to, if you went through something really horrible, you don't want to lose the utility. Make it useful. Milk it for all it's worth for the rest of your life whenever you need to. So that's step number one. Sometimes I'll say to a client, what are, what are the negative things you've seen, heard, or experienced about money to start with? And the sooner we can get off the stuff that is directly about money, maybe going into the eating disorder or childhood sexual abuse or the car accident, whatever it is, uh, that is where we, we just want to find where is the most energy and the most pain the most what's not right with the world. And then, when you have enough pain and you can feel it, because by the way, this is not an intellectual exercise, when you feel it, then you make it a person. You make the root cause. 
the monster. And often I tell my own story. I didn't intuitively feel that this time, but I'm going to tell you my... Would you like to hear my story and how it worked out for me? Okay. So back in 2002, I'd already been a coach for about six years. I had all these movie star clients, directors, producers. They were winning awards, getting primetime TV hits. First-time director sold his film for half a million dollars. And I was struggling to make $100 a month living in Los Angeles, one of the most expensive cities in the world. So I had this like horrible, heavy, shameful secret and it was so unfair because I was seeing people... I, this is when I learned that I can feel superior and inferior simultaneously because I was judging myself as better coaches, better than other coaches who are making a lot more money. Nobody else has done that, right? Um, and I've, I, hit, I hit my bottom. You know, like program has its bottom. I hit my, my entrepreneurial bottom where after I had just invested in yet another class, like I kept getting more certifications, taking more business classes, and I had the website and the brochure and the business cards and the taglines, and I had the celebrity clients, and I had the testimonials, and I'm making a hundred frickin' dollars a month. And I took a class in overcoming sales objections, and I'm a good student. I aced that. Seven people in a row said they would hire me. Zero showed up and zero paid. And that was when I was ready to leave the planet. I had run out of hope. And none of my teachers and none of my coaches could figure out what was going on because I was such a good client and so bad at getting paid. And I remember this moment of being in my bedroom and just like dragging shut the drapes, blacking out the room, getting on my bed and just screaming, screaming and crying crying in despair, and I felt hated by the universe, and I hated the universe back, and I didn't know what to do. And I just cried. And when I cried myself out, I had this thought that money needed to be my next area of spiritual growth. Maybe because I'm from California and spirituality comes easy. And the other piece was, I got curious about what was going on inside of me that couldn't be with money because it didn't make sense. I had done everything I'd been told my whole life, including going to an Ivy League college. I was promised. I was promised I was going to make money, and nothing, nothing I did was a match for my superhuman powers to push it away, and I wanted to know why I was doing it. And something weird happened. About two days later, I was on the call with my coach. I'm making no money, but I still have a coach. And I'm still taking classes and all that kind of... That's... Thank God. Uh, my coach had a weird and inspired moment. Because he had been working with me for months, and he didn't know what was wrong either. And out of the blue, he asked Morgana, if your money was a person, who would your money be? And whoa, I saw my money instantaneously. He was like this big, scary, dirty, violent biker who caused fights and terrified me. No insult to bikers. It was that one. And I could imagine being at a live event with him and having my eye on him the whole time to create maximum distance. And in that moment, I realized what I'd been doing unconsciously. Making money, a person takes the, the unconscious, the invisible, and makes it visible. I didn't know that I felt money was dirty or dangerous until it was a guy. And I knew there was no way I was going to have money in my life if it was that guy. He had to go. And fortunately, being a human being, I have experience ending relationships with other human beings. And that becomes very useful. So I got rid of the biker, yay, and created a new problem. I had just rejected money, and I live in Los Angeles. So I thought to myself, well, who could I want in my life so much that I'd be willing to have that person in my life even if he was money? Because if you've ever been in a really bad relationship, you're kind of gun-shy, and you don't want to do that again. 
So I asked myself, who would I want so much? And instantly, in my overactive imagination, I saw this tall, dark, handsome young man, clean cut, wearing a tuxedo, carrying a bouquet of red flowers, and wanting to woo me. And that is weird. I had never thought about money that way. Wanted to be with me, was in love with me, and was so sweet, and was so hurt by all the years and all the ways that I had rejected him, and I didn't want to be a jerk. By the way, that's huge. I didn't want to be a jerk to him. I didn't want to hurt his feelings, so I used my superpowers of codependency to make him happy. And I asked him what he needed from me.、And、by the way, this is huge. We have the body, so the power is in us. I'm not teaching you to invent some cute money fairy who's going to go out and do your life for you while you sit on the couch. That's that's not my thing. Your money partner, lover, ally exists because he or she loves you and sees you for who you really are. And champions you to be your best self because that's what lovers do. There's no scarcity here. When I talk about loving money, I am not talking about greed or coveting or jealousy or cheating or stealing, because that exploiting, harming. Is never love. Love is love. Love is generous. Love is noble. Love brings out our best, and that's the kind of relationship I'm talking about. Finally, so my money, honey, and I were having this conversation about all the times he had brought me clients who I had talked out of hiring without a clue that I was doing it until now, when I would look and I would find. How uncomfortable I was stating my fee. How I'd hide behind sample sessions because giving and healing was so much easier than accepting money, because money was a monster back then. So we made a deal that next time he sent me a client, I would say thank you because it was a gift of love. The next day, four people hired me at double what I'd ever charged before. And to be frankly honest, it was. One of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life to just shut the heck up and let them hire me because I built such a strong neurological pattern of somehow weaseling out of the sale. And now, so I've gone from making you know this history of making a hundred dollars a month to having hundred thousand dollar months, and traveling the world, getting married a hundred times in a hundred countries with that very handsome guy. And so, let me walk you through the steps of my story so that you can do it for yourself. Number one, uncover the root cause. It's never about money. It's about your own worth, lovability, and safety in this world. When I talk about relationship with money, I'm really talking about relationship with life. But I call it money. I pretend it's money because money is that area of life that needs my love and healing a lot. Number two, when you've dug up enough of whatever you have that energy around, then you pretend that there's this imaginary all bad person who's been pulling the strings and is responsible for all of it, responsible for all the worst things anybody has done to you. Respond and and. The worst thing you've ever said to yourself is not coming from you; it's coming from the monster. And the person with the biggest, baddest monster wins because the bigger and badder the monster is, the bigger and more real and more lasting and more wonderful the opposite will be. The money, honey, will always be stronger than the monster. So you want to get the biggest, baddest monster you can. Because it creates leverage like a slingshot, it creates this tension that makes the opposite inevitable. You want the monster to be intolerable. Step number three. Can you guess what step number three is? Get almost there. 
Get rid of the monster by any means necessary, the bloodier the better, which is really weird because all of my clients are like healing vegan light workers. <laughs> it's imaginary. There's tremendous power in taking out that warrior energy and saying, enough, death to whatever does not serve. Yes, off with your head, the monster's head. Then, then you create a vacuum, a space for all that's left, and all that's left is only good, only love. And then you give that form in the gender of your choice. And then, now you've got a person, money is a person. And I found that the lover archetype works best, just from a dollars and cents or euro <laughs> or rupaya or whatever. The, uh, there was a time early on when I first started trying this out on other people, and people had money honeys that were dogs and cats. Dogs and cats know zip about money. And, and there's a real limit to the intimacy that you can have with them. So there's something about lovers that are equals, and there's a vulnerability. You can break your money honey's heart because the power is really with you. So step number five is having a conversation with your money honey. And then step number six is action. Positive vibes are awesome. But if you want to have real, tangible, physical results, there's nothing more empowering than taking real, concrete, physical action, measurable, that you can say, yes, you did. Because your money honey, when you ask him what he needs or what she needs from you, your money honey will say things like, love yourself, or love me, or trust me, or something like that. Very healthy, wonderful Yoda-like. And I, for one, have never been capable of loving myself and being nice to myself or anything for every second for my whole life. That's, that's a goal we keep working towards. But we also want to give you a concrete win to let yourself know and your money, honey, know the relationship has changed. So you take positive action. And I'm going to give you a couple of actions to do right now or soon after my talk, sometime today. Uh, either in your bag or on the table out there is my business card where I'm in a red dress on my back with my heels in the air. On the back of the card is the opt-in for my four-part Money Magnetic video series, which is about what I taught you today, but also a lot of stuff that I didn't get to, like how do you charge what you want to when every one of your competitors is slashing their prices? Or what if you're on this prosperity path and your partner is not? Stuff like that. So that's part, that's part of the four-part video series. And also, not on the card, but you may find it fun, is you can also, for free, get my Money Honey app. You'll never guess the URL for that. Moneyhoneyapp.com. <laughs> uh, and one of the... And you'll immediately get the archive of all of my, my Morgana Radio interviews, including with Vicky, and, and just periodic doses of inspiration and, and weekly new interviews on money, love, and magic. And I have two minutes left. Any questions on money and love? Then I am going to finish with my wish for you. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, step number one. Great question. Uncover the root cause. Step number two. Personify your money monster. Step number three. Get rid of your money monster by any means necessary. Step number four. Meet your money honey. Step number five, dialogue with your money, honey. And step number six, take concrete measurable action. You're welcome. So I would say my final words for you is you are going to have a relationship with money for the rest of your life. 
really truly until the day you die. So you want to make it a good one. You want a relationship with money where the more loving you are and the more loved you are and the more in alignment with your values you are, the more you prosper. Because that removes all the resistance. It makes it safe for you to fulfill your purpose in this world. Thank you so much. All right, so we've got another book. We were fortunate enough to have Morgana participate with Joe Vitale, Jackie Lappin, who you'll be meeting shortly, um, in a wonderful anthology in our Ready, Aim series. We're on our eighth one now. This is Ready, Aim, Inspire, and it's very inspirational. And throw out that stress puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, come on up. Here's the book, Morgana. If you want to present that to her. <laughs> then we also have another piece to the puzzle. So, Morgana, you want to throw that? Come on up. <laughs> so you can pick a piece out there. Yes, you do. And good luck. You might be in our next bestseller. Okay, and now I would love to bring up something that um, Morgana manifested in her life, and it's a mo most wonderful man who has married her in the most exotic places, so many times I can't count. <laughs> Devin, come on up. <laughs> that was wedding number three. <laughs> Devin's going to tell us why he did this wonderful thing for his wife. And also, um, he's going to be at our 2017 going, uh, IPI Awards going into great detail about how he has traveled all over the world free, and it has made a, a tremendous career for him. Devin? Hi, this is, who, who in their right mind wants to follow Morgana Ray? Uh, but, but here I am. Um, if it goes poorly, she'll tell me all about it on the ride home. Um, so, so what happened? Um, I am the editor-in-chief of uh, an online publication called In the No Traveler. Uh, that means I get to travel a lot. Um, and in terms of cracking the code, I've sort of cracked the code of the travel industry. And so I'm not going to bore you with all kinds of crazy details, but I was on safari in, uh, in South Africa, just off the border of Botswana, which is spectacular and mind-boggling and so beautiful I don't have enough words and there was my, my wife was uh, uh, then my girlfriend and she was uh, doing a Bali retreat and due to the time difference the only way I could speak to her was if I uh, would get a guy to come to my door like the hut in the middle of like the plains and would walk me so I could Skype with her for five minutes on a bad recording, so it's like 4 a.m., and this guy would come get me. And this one particular morning, uh, we're walking, and I mean no joke, there was a lion roar right behind us. I mean, like, and by the way, it is really different when there is no fence, and it's not like a movie. <laughs> like, I mean... And, and just as that happened, there was like a thing in a bush that shook violently. 
and my first reaction was like, see ya, and I'm like ready to run, and the guy next to me, and this is his job, is to like, don't run your food. <laughs> so I didn't run, and he kind of walked me back, and then he had to check it out, and, and anyway, so we Skyped, and there was this moment where I realized, because relationships are hard, and I'm sure you probably understand this by being in one, whether it's a, a romantic relationship or any other kind, I was uh, all of a sudden wondering, like, well, what's going on here? I am willing to brave lions at 4 o'clock in the morning so I can have a couple minutes of conversation with this woman. It must mean something. And so the long story short, when she got back, when we finally saw each other, when I returned from Africa, we eloped. And yeah, it rocked. Um, and so, so I eloped, and when we, we came back, I had another assignment in Puerto Vallarta a couple weeks later, and my wife and I are walking uh, down this sort of like the iconic downtown street in Puerto Vallarta, and there we're passing by the iconic church, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I almost nonchalantly said, hey, honey, do you want to get married in there? And she said, absolutely. And so the woman standing next to us was also a fellow writer, uh, a woman named Tamalee. I don't know if you, anybody here is familiar with Tamalee's tips. Anyway, she said, I'm ordained. And I said, great, you're presiding. And I took off my wedding ring. And we marched up to the front, and there were people praying because it's a cathedral, and that's what people do in there. And we marched to the front, and, and Tamalee started talking about her life and her love and her own amazing relationship. And as she spoke, I started realizing, you know, when we got married, there were things I said during the vows that was like, geez, I wanted to say a little bit more. And that was my opportunity, because I knew my wife two weeks longer. I had two weeks more relationship with her. But ironically, like, there's some stuff that was like I needed to say to her. And so I started saying them. And keep in mind, this whole time, I'm thinking in my head, like, yes, this is real, but it's kind of a goof, let's be honest. It's sort of a silliness. And when I started telling her what it was that I wanted for her happiness, what I wanted to bring to the table for her to promote her happiness, her peace, her well-being, I could see in her expression how much it meant to her. I could see, I mean, she started crying. I hope I, did I let out a secret? I know. <laughs> so, so when I had that opportunity to tell her this stuff, and I knew how much it meant to her. It took me like just a few days to kind of recognize that the words that I needed to be saying to her, I needed to say to her not just a one-time thing. I needed to keep saying them over and over and over again. So I kind of, we, we started planning a trip. And, you know, because I, I know the globe. I'll be frank with you. And when she was like, hey, I want to go to Greece, I was like, yeah, that sounds great, but we need to stop in Croatia. And by the way, when we're in Croatia, we could just like drive to Trebinje in Bosnia. Oh, and by the way, if we're there, why don't we do these other things? So all of a sudden, Greece was gone, and we had like these 10 other places, and I quite literally made, I made some calls to some contacts, and I'm sorry if I'm going long. Um, I started calling up some travel people that I knew, like the, from the tourism boards, and I quite literally said, hey, listen, I'm coming, I'm gonna write some articles, I'm gonna sh you know, shoot some pictures, I'd like to do some stuff and start working with you. Oh, and by the way, my wife and I are getting married 100 times in 100 countries, we're gonna get married in your country, do you know a shady Glen and a hobo who could marry us? Because it really doesn't matter, anybody could do it. And uh, for the most part, it was like, yeah, you know, we have a Shady Glen. I don't think we have hobos. But I think we can do something better. And so I think the picture that you're looking at was actually something that was shot by one of the guys who does Game of Thrones. Uh, and it was a, a, a gorgeous thing. So we keep doing this over and over. Why am I telling this story? <laughs> It's oh good. I hope you're enjoying it. So so that's kind of what's happened over the last uh, a couple of years. We're actually 
we are uh, we're actually planning a, a trip to South Africa, and uh, I think we're going to Costa Rica, and we're going to keep getting married because we should. And I guess if there's any lesson here, tell the person that you were with. And by the way, dudes, guys, this is the smartest thing I've ever freaking done. <laughs> smartest thing ever. Because for that, now seriously, like I know we're all kind of like, again, it's sort of like, it's kind of a goof, right? Getting married a whole bunch of times is kind of a goof. But here's the thing, like real, real world stuff, guys. When I tell my wife really what I want for her, what I will do for her, how I am here to be of service to her, not only am I reminding myself that I've chosen this person above all others, I am giving her the security and the safety because you know, listen, we go out there and sometimes it totally sucks. It's awful what happens out there. In our home, she knows she's safe. In that moment, she has safety and security within our relationship. She doesn't have to question where I'm going. She doesn't have to have all kinds of crazy thoughts. I mean, she may have those, but what she does is she walks out into the world and she knows that the relationship that she has with me is on solid ground. I get to act as uh, a soft landing for her. And that's what a marriage, that's what a relationship is supposed to be. So, I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, there's, by the way, when I have a happy, love, love, well-loved woman, I mean, I can just say I'm a lucky guy. My life, my life is really made, uh, it's easy, it's easy. I mean, don't get, don't get me wrong, we still have some issues, but that's part of it. We, you know, we're always holding up mirrors for each other uh, to improve and to get over our nonsense, and I mean that with great love when I say the word nonsense. But at the end of the day, we are secure within our relationship, which is kind of a wonderful thing. Anyway. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Devin. For you. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous, isn't it?